Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Julia Duchesne, uh, and I work for Community Services Government of Yukon, uh, and I'm going to be moderating today. Uh, today we'll be hearing from the Minister of Community Services, Richard Mostyn, who will be speaking about resources to support government's capacity to respond to wildfires in the Yukon. We'll also be hearing from Mike Smith, Chief Meteorologist with Wildland Fire Management. Uh, please do hold your questions, media, until both speakers have concluded. Um, we'll definitely have time for a question from every outlet and hopefully for a follow-up question as well. Uh, but please uh, hold them until, uh, until we've heard from our speakers. So first off, Minister Mostyn. Thank you very much, Julia, for the introduction. Good day, everyone. I'm Richard Mawson, the Minister of Community Services, and we're gathered here today on the sunny and warming traditional territories of the Kwan Don First Nation and the Ton Quachin Council. Um, today, we're going to provide an update about wildfire preparedness. Um, after several intense seasons across Canada, um, I know that Yukoners are thinking very hard about the spring and summer ahead. Um, we usually start seasonal briefings a little later in the year, but we're here today to talk about how the Yukon government is preparing um, for spring and importantly to remind Yukoners that now is the time to start thinking about your personal preparedness and actions that you can take uh, to safeguard your family and property in the face of wildfires. Um, we're getting prepared and we need you to be doing the same. I'll also be making an announcement about initiatives Yukoners can expect to see in the budget uh, that will increase Yukon government's capacity to respond to wildfires in communities across the Yukon. I will then hand it over to Wildland Fire Management's Mike Smith to discuss seasonal outlook, uh, the seasonal outlook for wildfires and the ongoing work within the Yukon government to prepare for the upcoming wildfire, wildland fire season. Um, the changing climate means wildfire risk is unpredictable and can now extend well into autumn. The Yukon government maximizes federal funding opportunities to support our response uh, to wildfires and building wildfire resilient Yukon communities. Um, the Yukon government has found new sources of funding to increase our territory's wildland firefighting resources. In June, wildland fire management entered into a multi-year $19.6 million funding agreement with Canada called Fighting and Managing Wildfires in a Changing Climate. With this money, uh, the team is planning, procuring and deploying uh, firefighting equipment and training to increase our capacity to fight wildfires throughout the territory. For equipment, we're buying and deploying communications, first aid, washing and cooking trailers to support crews as they fight fires. Um, we are also buying hose, pumps, radios and personal protective equipment for wildland firefighters to make sure they're protected in the field and have the equipment they need to do their jobs. Each year we're investing in training, including for members of the Yukon First Nation Wildfires 20 person unit crew and for initial attack firefighters on Yukon government contract crews. We will also support staff, uh, we, were, we will also train support staff and officers, people who, people who are vital to the success of our wildfire response. This year, $2.7 million of the budget of this multi-year funding is in the budget. In December, Yukon government announced it had added new actions to our clean future. I'd like to draw attention to three projects we approved for funding under our clean future phase two projects that while um, projects that wildfire for uh, for wildfire forecasting and response support. We will add a meteorologist and a data scientist to wildland fire management's branch to improve forecasting services. Uh, and we will also buy a clean air shelter and we will invest in the development of community wildfire protection plans. Um, our clean future phase two is uh, also includes funding that I mentioned at the flood preparedness briefing last month to review and update emergency preparedness communications that support household resilience to climate related hazards, including wildfires. Yukon has 14 agreements with Yukon First Nations for initial attack services. The latest iteration of the agreement provided an additional $1.2 million for increased crew wages, benefits, overtime pay, vehicles, 
fuel rates and an extra 10 days of work per season. As I said, the season is extending longer into, into autumn now, so we need to have the resources on the ground for a longer period of time. We will look forward to working with Yukon First Nations Wildfire as a partner again in the upcoming season, offering a 20-person unit crew in representation for some initial attack agreements. Wildland Fire Management provides two annual transfer payment agreements to Yukon First Nation Wildfire for training, one for the unit crew capacity and development activities, and one for their Beat the Heat training program. That totals $175,000 a year. Uh, the budget, uh, in the budget, community services is investing in improving planning, communications and capacity initiatives to better prepare for climate emergencies like wildfires. Um, this funding is subject to legislative approval, of course, and we will see if the opposition parties will support funding to improve the Yukon's response to wildfire, if they will support our efforts to improve Yukon's safety for everyone. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Mike Smith, uh, and he will let you know some of the uh, detailed work that the department is doing on the air in the area of wildfire suppression and preparedness. Mike. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister Mostyn. Uh, my name is Mike Smith. Uh, I'm the chief meteorologist with the Econ Wildland Fire Management Branch. Um, as far as the mandate for the branch, uh, it remains uh, mostly unchanged from past years where uh, the branch is tasked with pr uh, protecting life, critical infrastructure and property throughout the territory, um, providing this service from six main centres throughout the territory uh, as it has in past years. Uh, we also work with uh, other communities and uh, governments to help create wildfire resilient communities within the Yukon. Uh, starting off with a quick summary of, of last season. Uh, which feels like it just ended. Uh, <clears throat> Wildland Fire responded to over 200 fires uh, in the territory, which is uh, above our long term average, uh, burning approximately 400,000 acres or hectares, pardon me. Um, likewise, uh, a lot more than we usually see. Um, in the spring, uh, we also assisted with some flood response to the Klondike Valley and deployed to neighboring jurisdictions uh, basically from May through November uh, to assist in Alberta, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia with, uh, with their fires as well. Um, last year was a slow start for us, or, or maybe more of a, a normal start, but uh, a warm June and especially July did uh, dry things out quite a bit. Um, in 2023, 27% of all the wildfires in the territory uh, were high risk in terms of their proximity or potential to impact communities or critical infrastructure. So uh, thinking things like power lines, uh, largely power lines and, and telecommunications. Um, our teams in many regions were challenged by a number of wildfires of note, uh, evacuation alerts and orders, uh, critical infrastructure threats or disruptions, uh, severe shortage of aerial resources, including especially helicopters nationally and in the territory here. Uh, so crews did a fantastic job in those initial attack efforts. There were a number of, uh, without those efforts, the, the impacts likely would have been greater. So I do want to recognize the work the crews did last year with some, under some challenging circumstances. Um, some of the wildfires of note did include the Takini River Bridge fire, uh, fairly close to uh, here in Whitehorse, XY19. That led to some evacuation alerts in the Ibex Valley in early July. Uh, that was followed in early August by evacuation uh, alerts and orders in uh, Mayo, as well as Old Crow uh, evacuated due to nearby wildfires. Uh, looking ahead for this year, we are increasing our response capacity uh, once again and incorporating uh, as we try to every year, lessons learned from, from the past season and last summer. Uh, so moving on to the response capacity and a few changes this year. Uh, we do have capacity from April 1st to September 30th uh, each season. Uh, that's unchanged from past years. Uh, once crews are fully staffed with seasonal workers returning, uh, there are 24 wildfire crews in bases across the territory. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, that's comprised of 10 Yukon government crews and 14 Yukon First Nation crews. Uh, giving approximately 75 initial attack firefighters and another 40 uh, administrative and officer staff uh, to assist with managing the crews and aircraft. Uh, we have two air tanker groups once again this, this season, uh, along with the supporting ground crews there and uh, helicopters uh, locally on contract, as we have in past seasons. 
Uh, to support the air tanker program, uh, we continue to train air attack officers who are in very short supply across the country as well. Uh, so we do have two officers currently going through or midway through their training. Uh, these are specialized positions that require both an aptitude, uh, a lot of experience with fire and uh, highly technical and frankly dangerous work, uh, as well as the ability to dedicate three to four years of training prior to certification. Uh, so we're quite happy with the progress made there. Um, each year, uh, Yukon does hire new firefighters through a competitive process um, that's filling vacancies with uh, capable individuals to then undergo rigorous training, uh, nationally certified training, um, uh, before becoming qualified crew members and crew leaders and being deployed out to assist with suppression efforts. Uh, there were some changes made in 2024 uh, based on a few years uh, of work strategizing more creative methods to attract and retain employees. Uh, employee retention is another thing that we, we are trying to continually approve, improve upon. Um, for this season, WFM Wildland Fire has hired new crew members through a winter recruitment campaign. Uh, saw 130 resumes received in the first week. Uh, we're quite happy with that. Uh, in some cases, casual crews or a fourth crew member uh, to, to complement the, uh, the core three-person crew have been hired to bolster response capacity uh, given the high number of experienced candidates. Uh, moving on to communications, especially during emergencies. Uh, we will have our fire information team that I'm sure you're, most of you are familiar with from past years, uh, returning this year as well. Uh, they've been working both in the off season and will continue to work hard this season to provide uh, accurate and timely information to assist uh, media and the, and the public in, in getting the uh, accurate information out there. Uh, during a wildfire, the conditions can change rapidly on the ground. So our goal is to share both uh, the relevant but also timely and important communication through whatever channels are available and are, are used in that particular community. So uh, our hope is that residents and travelers can both find relevant information um, easily uh, th about the wildfire information as well as potential impacts to their plans from the wildfires. Uh, this spring, we are continuing to update our communications tools, um, including uh, that's based on uh, feedback from the public and emergency response partners from uh, last season. Um, that includes the Wildfire Hub, the, the online page with uh, the map showing location and status of fires. So we, we do hope some of those improvements will, will help people for this coming season. Um, and then the final messaging from the communication side of thing is uh, during the season, stay tuned to Yukon government channels, be they social media, um, local government, local media. Um, and the latest information on the wildfires and emergencies can always be found on yukon.ca slash emergencies. And that has a link to the wildfire hub, uh, as well as the flood atlas. And uh, you can also follow Yukon Protective Services on Facebook. Um, this spring, uh, the question, uh, like Minister Mostyn alluded to, it's, uh, we're a little bit early this year, but uh, of course, given the news from down south, we, we're always looking to see what, what we think the, the coming year will bring as far as fires. Uh, so in early March, uh, it's unfortunate we just don't have the predictive ability to, to make any kind of really accurate position of what the summer will be like. Uh, but we can say a few things based on what the fall, what last fall was like, and as, as well as what kind of rain or snowfall we had over the winter. So uh, in that sense, Yukon is doing quite well relative to most of Western Canada. Um, from October through February, uh, we actually had broadly between about 90 and 110 percent of normal precipitation across the territory so um, mostly as snowfall but uh, those of us in the south saw the, the rainfall there in January as well uh, but but that's good news that that's in stark contracts to some other jurisdictions so the rain and snow did come and the rain especially in late fall um, some areas of uh, of the territory actually received more snowfall than normal uh, northern sections of the Dempster and Old Crow uh, both from measurements and community reports hearing of quite a bit more snow than normal up in uh, some of the northern regions so that, that's some good news for us as far as the fires go um, based on that and based on some early indications of some of the seasonal uh, weather model forecast outlooks uh, we're not seeing any possibility of like an early early uh, severe season so uh, for anyone who's around in 2019 that would be an example of an earlier season whereas this year we expect when the snow does melt uh, it will ease into the fire season rather than have uh, a stark uh, a rapid start there um, in terms of temperature uh, the the outlooks we look at this time of year looking at one to three months are generally correct in terms of will it be warmer or cooler than normal uh, right now the environment canada models are showing actually 
probably the best guess is just near normal for the next three months, March, April, May. So um, not to say there won't be a particularly warm week or cold week in there, but the odds of it warming up suddenly and staying warm and the snow melting early uh, are pretty low right now. So again, as far as fires go, that's good news for us here. Um, so the best we can predict right now, um, combined with the fact that uh, the wildfire drought code that we use, uh, a measure of drought uh, to uh, look at the possibility of severe or larger fires uh, is also quite low. Uh, so we're quite confident in saying that it will be at least a normal start to the year uh, with no real potential for larger severe fires until we get into early mid June and then we're we're much like last year it'll depend on what those months bring in terms of temperature and rainfall but uh, we can take some solace in the fact that at least to start off we're we are looking fairly good um, as we get closer to the spring the government will be sharing uh, more information about wildfire risk as we we get more data in and uh, obviously get closer to the, the fire season itself um, and we we will participate in the emergency measures organizations targeted briefings for local governments uh, and response agencies in uh, April and those are ten, tend to be when we have a little bit more confidence about what the, the start of the fire season will bring. Uh, moving on finally to community and personal preparedness uh, through the our clean future strategy as Minister Mostyn uh, mentioned uh, wildland fire leads the prevention and mitigation activities in many Yukon communities. Uh, this includes community-led uh, fire smart projects across the territory, uh, which has been ongoing for uh, several decades at this point, and also more recently, more landscape-level mitigations like we see in the Whitehorse uh, South uh, Shaded Fuel Break. Um, this also includes developing or and assisting with the development of uh, community wildfire protection plans uh, through a collaborative process between communities and wildland fire management. There have been a couple signed off and several more are uh, in the queue th throughout either consultation or draft phases. So we're, we're quite happy with uh, how those are going as well. And uh, finally, just focusing a little bit more to follow up on Minister Mostyn's comments about uh, you know, what you can do to take action, what you can do to reduce your risk and be prepared. Uh, there's the website preparedyukon.ca uh, contains a number of guidelines on making personal preparedness an emergency plan having an emergency kit um, if you haven't already now and we know lots of people have but if you haven't it's time to think about that and, and take that important step uh, before we get into the fire and flood season um, there's some more you can do to improve your home's resilience uh, we we do live in a, a beautiful boreal forested area but one of the, the potential downsides is those trees are combustible so um, doing things like following fire smart principles on your property uh, that can be things like uh, just removing combustible materials from adjacent to your house uh, looking at using different siding if you're residing your house that uh, that is less combustible or flammable and uh, it will also assist our firefighters uh, in the worst case scenario if they have to respond to a uh, fire near your house uh, homes that have been fire smarted are much easier for them to to effectively protect than than ones that are covered by bush so uh, broadly, uh, you want to create a safety zone around your home uh, about 1.5 meters away from the edge of your home is where you want to remove all combustible materials, be it brush, wood piles, uh, old propane tanks, things that lots of people have sitting around. And as you expand outwards, uh, you remove larger, feel, uh, larger things that uh, can burn easily. So uh, flammable shrubs, uh, large or dead or dying trees, conifer trees especially, uh, keeping your, your grass cut, uh, especially when you have dry grass in the spring. And uh, if you use burn piles or burn barrels to maintain your property and keep it clean, just make sure you keep a close eye on it. Uh, you are responsible for that. Um, so making sure to watch for any embers uh, flying around and, and uh, not causing any other fires. Uh, finally, uh, as I mentioned, we can visit preparedyukon.ca or FireSmart Canada. Um, and or Yukon Protective Services social media channels, including Facebook. Um, they will all have uh, a number of tips, uh, including uh, ones pertinent to the specific time of year. So spring safety cleaning tips, for instance. Um, looking ahead for whatever the season brings this year, uh, we'll continue to work hard to keep uh, Yukoners safe and informed. And thank you for taking steps to uh, protect your own property and keep your home safe and to help your neighbors. And with that, uh, I will hand it back to Julia. Thank you so much, uh, Mike Smith and Mr. Mostyn. Before I open up for questions, I'm just going to make a couple comments on timelines um, and one housekeeping note. Um, so we are recording this uh, this press conference on Zoom, so we will be sharing it publicly, um, hopefully before too long. So just to keep that in mind while you're asking questions. 
Um, and then our next media briefing, um, in addition to briefing governments, local governments directly, as Mike mentioned, we do also host a mid-April media briefing um, about the flood and fire outlook. So that will still be happening and uh, you'll all get an invitation to that too. Um, that one falls after the April snow survey bulletin is released and the April flood risk assessment. Um, yeah, so I do look forward to seeing you all again then. Uh, we have, a, we're doing pretty well for time, so I'm going to say one question and one follow-up question for each outlet. We're going to start with the folks in the room. So that is uh, the news, the star and CBC, and I'll go in that order, starting with the news. Wayne is going to run the mic around for me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a question for uh, Minister Mostyn uh, to, to start with. Um, you mentioned the investment in the uh, the site trailers for the firefighting, the meals, first aid, uh, I can't remember what, what the third one was, hygiene perhaps. Um, is the decision to invest money in that, does that consider sort of the conversations that were had last summer around uh, fire firefighter burnout uh, in the midst of a serious season like last year? Um, and also um, staff retention, as uh, Mr. Smith mentioned there. Yeah, that's a great question. I really appreciate you bringing it forward, Jim. We, we, we have, um, I think it was Julia, as we were talking, brought up the uh, uh, well-known quote, an, an army runs on its stomach. So having food, uh, food trailers and that type of thing really does help, um, certainly with the morale and keeping the energy up of the teams that are out in the field. Um, and it is about retention and, and making sure lives are better for our employees on the ground in some of these very remote locations where they're forced to work to, to deal with these issues, um, the emergencies we're facing. But it goes beyond that. Um, you know, we mentioned, um, uh, so it's communications, which is, has been a major focus on our, on in every jurisdiction, the disaster uh, preparedness piece people always want better communication, so there's that. Um, but it's also um, wash trailers, and that comes into OHS regulations and, and need to make sure that our workers who are working um, in very remote locations can clean their garb and their gear to make sure it works well, but also protect them from, from um, uh, hazards in my face in uh, workplace hazards that they're facing. So that's important as well. Of course, cooking again, food, and the last um, the last uh, piece of that was uh, now I've just drawn a blank on it actually. So there's, um, I can go back to my notes, but it's it's cooking, washing, communications, and first aid. First aid, of course, and you can't. That's very very important as well, of course. So. Um, so yes, to your point, it's about retention, but it's more than that. It's about making sure that uh, our workers are safe and well looked after in some of these very remote places. Hope that helps. Follow up question? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I, I was just wondering if, um, given how serious some of the fires in the Yukon were, both, both in the Yukon uh, and in, say, northern BC that might affect our transportation routes, um, uh, is there any concern about fires, you know, burning underground and flaring up this year that, that you've heard about? And also, does the sort of positive outlook that you mentioned about conditions, um, does, does that have a positive effect on those as well? No, <clears throat> thank you. A good question. Uh, yeah, we're, uh, I only mentioned it really briefly, but the, uh, the, the drought code that we look at as far as fires, that's one of the things that dictates whether or not fires burning underground over the winter uh, are likely and that's where, I mean, there almost is a line on the 60th parallel where you go into northern BC and they, at least the northeast, I believe, had a few fires that were still smoldering. But in the Yukon, uh, both from our numbers kind of showing that it's unlikely and, and the lack of reports or, or satellite detections of any hotspots, uh, to our knowledge, there, there's nothing burning underground this winter in the Yukon. So um, once again, yeah, somewhere we're, we're fortunate. Uh, but to your point, uh, in northern BC, they are drier there, so that is something we're looking at and watching again this year and already having conversations with British Columbia on uh, any kind of joint management of those fires if necessary. Okay, thank you. Um, on to the star. 
Right, thank you. Uh, during the evacuations last summer, some community residents expressed some concerns about the quality and quantities of communications in terms of what they should do, how bad the danger was, etc. Have any improvements been made for the coming year to try and avoid some of the, uh, the dissatisfaction and outright anxieties that occurred in 2023? Um, I'll take the first and I'll move over to Mike if I could. Um, yeah, Jim, as you noted, uh, there is, uh, this is, uh, this is a complaint that I heard loud and clear, uh, both in phone calls I received from, from some residents and some leaders in these communities. Um, and it, it certainly continues to, to, uh, to be discussed in the community. Um, it's funny, you know, we live in a, in an age where, uh, from our phones to our iPads, we have more communication than we've ever had in the history of humanity, uh, and we still don't do it very well. And that's not a slight against the good folks at CS or within Health and Social or any of the other ones who are working very, 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 very hard and very, very uh, diligently on behalf of Yukoners. But the very fact that we've all got a printing press in our pocket gives us enormous power to be able to post to Facebook, Instagram, X, uh, or any of the social media channels or call our, our loved ones or friends and get the word out on whatever we're seeing at that moment in real time um, from, you know, often right on the front lines of the incident, the emergency that we're dealing with, that we're having to contend with. Um, that's both a blessing and a curse because um, it gives it it ramps up or amps up the uh, the uh, concern and the fear in the community and I can tell you that the team at community services the team at health is doing um, an amazing job triaging and making sure that the people who are most at risk are contacted as early as humanly possible about the risks that are going on. Um, what we're seeing often is that people who are, um, you know, I, I'm going to go back to Takini Bridge because that was certainly um, one of the first fires we saw this season uh, of any note and really did cause a lot of, of uh, concern and, and uh, uh, amongst residents in the area. But um, the team at CS uh, and Wildland Fire and, and they went out personally door to door and talked to residents and they had uh, they drove out very long driveways and and put post uh, uh, put signs on the on the highway um, very very quickly and phoned and if they couldn't phone they went door to door and put posts on people's fence posts knocked on doors those in the immediate uh, facing immediate threat the ones they didn't contact, first of all, were the ones that weren't an immediate threat. And yet they were still people calling because their friends were saying, you know, there's a fire there. And so that fear comes up. So I'm, I really appreciate your question. And I think it's important for all of us to uh, take some steps ahead of time to prepare for an emergency. Realize that in the event of these um, forest fires we're talking about today, that um, we do put people on alert to prepare them. Uh, very few fires we've had this last year were of um, where people had to leave immediately. They were put under evacuation alert, which gives you some time to prepare your residents, prepare your family, get um, livestock. And uh, livestock was a big concern the last time and start to make preparations for those things um, before you're actually asked to leave. And I know the team at CS does a remarkable job um, communicating, but it's never fast enough. And there's these are highly emotional situations with people's um, their their life, uh, their life's work in some cases, their house, their home, their business is uh, is in the path of danger. And it, yeah, you know, I've been under evacuation myself, and it's a very very difficult thing to go through and then you have to assess what you're going to take or fit in the back of your of your hatchback or whatever it is to get out of dodge as quickly as possible and what can you take and there's a lot you can't take so um are we making improvements i'll let 
uh, Mike talk to the specifics, but yes, we do after action reports. We're working continuously to assess how things were done and how we can improve them. Um, that said, there's always going to be in this uh, time of light in communication, uh, I doubt that government will ever be able to get ahead of the person with a cell phone on the front lines of a fire who are able to post to Instagram or to Facebook or to whatever social media is your, is your preference uh, before the professionals and the experts in this field can get ahead of it. So um, I think just, I've spoken quite a bit, but I'm going to put one last plug in to people. Um, we have our responsibility and we take it very seriously and we're, we are uh, practiced at it and getting more practiced at it responding to these things, unfortunately, but practice makes perfect. But citizens of the territory have to take some personal responsibility. So please, as Mike said earlier, fire smart your house. Go around and make sure you're cleaning out all the debris from underneath, from your gutters of your roof and making sure that all the debris from the uh, fall is cleared away from your decks and from away from your house. Move all uh, flammable material it's 1.3 or farther away from your house. Um, look at the way you're building your stuff. So these are things that people can do. Go through your house and make sure you've prioritized the things you want to save in the face of an emergency. Do it now. Put together a 72-hour kit. When you're traveling through the territory in summer or winter, take emergency preparedness, uh, take emergency gear, be it a sleeping bag, a tent, water, food, something to last you, last you for a couple of days because we are having landslides and fires and our road network is often fractured um, these days because of the changing climate. So take some responsibility, make sure you're safe. And if you're around the White Horse area or your community in the summertime, make sure your fuel, your, your vehicles are fueled up and ready to go. Um, don't let your, uh, don't let your uh, gas tank get down to empty, trying to fill it up a little bit more frequently. Uh, it'll save you, a little, it'll make, you feel like you're saving a little bit on the gas tank, but uh, it'll also keep you prepared in the event of an emergency. So I think those are a few things we can do. But as far as communication goes, um, we are trying to improve it. As a matter of fact, that's why we're here this afternoon in March, is trying to get people to thinking about this thing and communicating, acting, actively taking steps to make people know a little bit more. We're going to do it again in April. We're going to hit this a few more times just to make sure people get the message that we are on the job and we are working very hard, but also um, there are things that they can do too to prepare. I hope that's a very long answer. Jim, I'm going to pass it over and make it even longer. Mike, do you have anything to add on that? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mostyn. Uh, I'll, I'll be fairly quick and I, I do agree that the social media is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, we, we actually find out about a lot of fires from people posting on Facebook or sending us pictures, so that's good. But as it pertains to evacuations, uh, yeah, no, no disagreement that uh, there's always ways we can improve. Um, before I speak to a couple points where we're trying to improve, uh, I will say that a lot of the times when there is an active or, or pending evacuation order, our communications people end up spending probably as much time on calls with people who have been given incorrect information by their friends and neighbors uh, as they do, you know, actually uh, disseminating the correct information. So the, the one thing I will say is, is if you think there's an evacuation pending or some something big happening, you know, do try to check the government information channels if you're able um, first. But that being said, uh, yeah, we, we do recognize there's, there's always ways that, that we can improve. So um, the wildfire hub, the, the map, product is, is one way we're trying to improve by putting uh, more information and more relevant information on a current fire status in the cases when we have a GPS of a fire perimeter, putting that up so people can see where the fire actually is. Sometimes it can be tough to tell the fire's two kilometers away or 20 kilometers away. Uh, so just giving more, more and more accurate information and just having that available. And then we're always working at one of the roles I fill besides meteorologist is as, as a duty officer. So I work with our, our communications folks quite a bit um, and, and mostly through their ideas, not mine, but they, you know, they're, they're constantly working on ways to better, better communicate. And, you know, when do we give this extra information or say, for an example, if there's an evacuation alert, giving the information on, we're putting this alert in place because we expect it to be windy tomorrow. Um, so we expect this to be a one-day 
issue like a bit more detail on why we're doing this and maybe the duration. So uh, those are maybe two specific things we're, we're doing uh, within wildland fire and with the communications to, to try to improve uh, future evacuation uh, alerts, orders, uh, states of emergency and communications thereof. Um, but we, we are certainly listening and, and you know, in, in many cases, just like we heard lots of stories down in BC, you know, our, our staff who are doing the evacuation are also the ones being evacuated um, or having the homes evacuated. So they're, um, they take that to heart as well. Okay, do you have a follow-up question? A quick one for Mr. Mostyn. Um, in the last year, there's been talk of uh, assembling a mobile national creating fire force to go to hotspot areas where required. Would you see uh, a useful role for such an entity in the Yukon and have you or would you plan to perhaps lobby the federal government to, to further that concept? Um, thanks, Jim. And it's bold of you to ask a follow-up question after my long, overlong response before, so I appreciate you jumping into the breach. But, um, so you're talking about actually having uh, a national forced uh, response unit, is that right? Yeah, we actually have been involved in discussions at the federal, provincial, territorial level with ministers from across the country on this concept. Um, we actually have uh, resource sharing networks, but I know the federal government is certainly interested in trying to and is exploring um, that as an option. Uh, we have the um, uh, the CIFC arrangements where we actually have a pool of resources that are shared. What we're seeing, and, and it's necessitated, like in the past, as I understand it, and I'll let Mike correct me because I'm, I'm not an expert in this field, though I'm gaining some experience just through dint of working with folks here. Um, the our fire seasons are changing. In the past, we'd have certain jurisdictions would get into the fire season a lot earlier and others would go later and, you know, the whole thing was staggered. So the resources we had, maybe BC wouldn't have fires, but Ontario wouldn't be able to shift those resources around. Now it's becoming ubiquitous. Our fire seasons are coming earlier, they're staying later, as we've mentioned in the territory there, we're into autumn now, where normally we wouldn't see anything like that. And so, it is putting a further strain on the resources and the ability for us to share. And I think this year we really saw um, uh, a shortage, which then we were pulling it from the Southern Hemisphere where, again, their fire season is reversed from us. So we're able to do that. And so those arrangements are also in place and we're seeing firefighters from South America and Australia coming here and vice versa, just because the, the climate is shifting so quickly and so dramatically that we're having to do that. Um, but I do know, to answer your question, that at the federal level, there is a uh, appetite to explore some sort of national service. We don't know what that looks like yet, but all of the, all the ministers responsible for um, safety and preparedness are talking about this and actively working on this file. So more to come on that in the coming months and years, I would imagine, but um, it is something that certainly we are talking about. Hope that answers your question, at least in part, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike for any additions that he or insights he might be able to provide. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, as Minister Austin said, uh, we do have the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Centre uh, that allows the resource sharing from within Canada and also facilitates, uh, uh, one of the ways to facilitate getting resources from the US. Um, this past year, and I'm, I'm going to get this number wrong, but I want to say it was something like 14 Other countries, do you know, Julia? I don't the top of my head. It, it was a large number, I'd say 13, 14, 15 other countries, uh, which was about triple the number of countries we've used in Canada um, in prior years. So I'll say, yeah, clearly we, we recognize that uh, seasons are changing and uh, what we have set up is not appropriate or doesn't work as it has in the past. So as far as a national force, uh, I guess just speaking from from wildland fire management's uh, point of view, I think more resource availability is certainly uh, a, a good thing to have. Uh, that might be one way to do it. Uh, other ways may be just bolstering other international agreements or, mm -hmm. or other provinces and territories uh, bolstering theirs. So um, from our perspective, uh, more resources or more resource availability is good. And I guess how, how that arrives, we'll, we'll leave to our uh, 
our bosses to figure out the best way to do that. We are investing, of course, in Yukon First Nation wildfire as well. We've, we're making strategic investments to sort of broaden and diversify <coughs> our firefighting resources. Um, both our Yukon Wild, Wildland Fire and uh, Yukon First Nation wildfire did an amazing job. Uh, they were shipped out to other jurisdictions and picked up a lot of experience that way too. So, um, as I said earlier, practice makes perfect, and unfortunately, we're getting an awful lot of practice in these things. So that's uh, I wouldn't. I, it's not the best way to go about it, but I think we're getting a lot of skills and a lot more experience in this field. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm now going to hand it over to CBC and then I'll have APTN on deck from uh, from the Zoom chat. Hey, this is Raf. I'm with CBC News. Um, uh, my, my first question will be for Wildland Fire. Um, you know, looking back at the previous fire season, specifically speaking about Ibex Valley. Now, folks at Wildland, Wildland Fire was kind enough to give us uh, several members of the media to give folks access to the fire break works that was happening at the time. Now, f what we saw folks, like these were very motivated individuals, hard, hard at work, and it will be fair to say that this territory has its fair share of world-class firefighters. But the folks that well, we, we have talked to, they were working very long days and multiple days on end. Now, heading into this fire season, compared to the resources in terms of labor inputs and technical resources, uh, do you feel more confident heading into this fire season compared to 2023? That's a good question. Um, I do, I, I do feel a little bit more confident this year for the Yukon specifically. Uh, I guess just, uh, you know, the downside was we had the season we had, the upside was we gained a lot of experience. And uh, like Minister Mostyn said, um, we have a lot of crews that started last year in a sense where they're green, they needed supervision. And by the end of the season, they are good to go run their own incidents or take on a lot more responsibilities. So, <clears throat> um, and from what I understand, we never know until people actually walk in the door in the spring, but I, from what I hear, our retention is quite high this year. So we should have a lot of returning, especially returning senior staff. Uh, so from our workforce, yeah, both both contracted and government employed, I, I think we're in very good shape for, for who we have. Um, we are though, you know, we know if things get really, really busy, it's a small workforce and we're, we're definitely cognizant of burnout um, and burnout and the intended mental health issues. So um, I would say after the last two or three years, that's something we're watching a lot more in terms of potentially asking for outside help earlier than we might have in the past. Um, but that's definitely not a knock on on the abilities of our, our crews, just uh, wanting to make sure that we, we don't break people when we look after our staff. And uh, for my second question, I guess this would be perhaps be for Minister Mawson. Um, just sticking with the Ibex, Ibex Valley topic now, some of the, the some of the properties of the residents there just were at the peak of it were just a few hundred meters away from the perimeter of the fire, and one of the risk mitigation measures folks were trying to take at the time was they were installing these sprinkler systems on top of their roofs. Um, is that something that is advisable ahead of time, or do certain risk thresholds have to be met when it becomes advisable? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, and I know that I'm going to, I may have to turn to Mike or the department, we may have to get back to you a little bit about this. Um, I do know that, you know, Wildland Fire has got uh, sprinkler systems and their industrial strength and they're doing these uh, and they're tested and they they're all ubiquitous. They're, they work amongst all of our pumps and everything else. Um, I know that people wanted uh, to put their own pumps and that you know sprinkler systems up. And I suppose um, uh, I think to my to my point earlier about having people look after their own properties. I think that might be something that people might want to invest in. But I don't know how it impacts the actual response when it comes to actually getting people um, our teams onto the site and then they have to look at two different systems and how where the water is coming from electrical and all that type of thing so I don't know how that complicates the um, the response I know that um, uh, 
uh, we have uh, very robust uh, sprinkler systems and, and we have the teams that and we've invested in those things so we will get them in place where they're needed um, whether I think what your question is is should people be investing in their own systems to protect their barns or whatever it is their houses uh, ahead of time with their own gear is that what you're suggesting yeah um, I'm going to say Mike, can you give me a hand or do you have any thoughts sure. on this from your on the ground experience? Because I don't think I have the expertise in the actual response piece. I think that's more uh, for the experts. So I'm going to stop talking now and pass it on to somebody who might know more than I do on this field. So Mike. Sure. Um, yeah, no, we are aware of uh, a few people who have gone and, and done that uh, just in anticipation of potential fire issues. <clears throat> um, no, no harm in doing, but the suggestion we would make is if they contact their their local uh, wildland fire office, <clears throat> and and they can let let folks know, uh, you know what, either what they would need to use so it's compatible with with our systems, so the crews could come in and plug, and also even give them some resources or point them towards some resources to doing that effectively. Um, but something sort of ironically, but it's uh, another thing nationally we've we've learned a lot about in the last few years about how to best deploy uh, sprinklers on structures so um, best practices have changed actually quite a bit in the last five years so that would be one suggestion uh, if uh, i'm aware of other people who have done you know just completely self-contained uh set up from a uh, pond or well well water or something or a holding tank they may have um, and if that's the case uh, yeah i'd still encourage them to to make contact with the local wildland uh, office and uh, you know if if they're not otherwise too occupied they're usually happy to at least give you advice at the very least or potentially come out and, and have a look at your property and make suggestions for setup so i don't i don't want to offer those those staff out uh, <laughs> but uh they're, they're certainly always happy to give advice um, okay great thanks and so i'm assuming you don't have a question okay um so i'm gonna now open up um for folks on zoom um first up sarah from aptn and then afterwards, uh, I will check in with CKRW, Darius, and Dan. Hi. Um, my question is for Minister Mostyn. Um, Obviously, last summer, we had um, two evacuations of communities, um, First Nations communities last summer. What are you hearing from First Nations about the upcoming wildfire season? And have they raised any concerns? Um, thank you very much for the question. We have uh, had a uh, robust discussion about this at uh, Yukon Days in Ottawa and also at the, uh, we are, uh, it has also come up with the, um, uh, at the Yukon Forum that we just recently held as well. We touched on it there. It is an issue for um, First Nations, but also municipalities. In my recent uh, you know, this summer we evacuated two First Nation communities, Mayo, uh, the Natural Nagdan First Nation in Mayo, and Vantak Wichin. But we also evacuated the community of, of uh, the community of Mayo, the municipality of Mayo. So it, it affects both our First Nations and municipalities. It is an issue certainly for leaders of both, um, of, of all uh, communities. Um, they are, I know that they are working very hard on their own emergency preparedness plans. I have said and will continue to say that municipalities and First Nations are the uh, architects of their own success. They know the communities better than, uh, than certainly we do uh, on the ground. And uh, they are, um, certainly municipalities have a responsibility for emergency preparedness within their boundaries. And I know they're taking that very seriously. The meeting I had recently with mayors just a few weeks ago uh, was um, we focused a lot on on emergency preparedness and what's happening in the coming uh, coming season, and uh, I know that people are are uh, reviewing their plans and thinking about this in a, uh, a very very hard and and um, deliberate way. I know that the. Um, you know, on that, you know, we just recently had Operation Inuk, which involved the municipality of Whitehorse, uh, the power companies, um, not, uh, the um, Kwanlin Dunn First Nation, the Ton Quachin Council, and Yukon Government Emergency Measures. 
and uh, other agencies. And you know, so that was to that was to um, that was talking about a power outage during a very a cold snap where it was very very cold, minus thirty and below. And what what do we do? So. I know it doesn't pertain directly to wildfires, but what it does do, the communication and that act, that tabletop exercise that we went through, that exercise we went through with the Canadian Armed Forces, um, it also helped build, I call it the synapses between our emergency response teams, both at the municipalities within the utilities, uh, within um, the First Nations. And so that exercise was, was to a specific emergency, but it also helps us um, reflect on and build the relationships that will serve us very well in the event of a real emergency. And that's, so as I say, uh, the practice we're getting, a practice that we actually impose on ourselves, uh, as well as the real world experience we're gaining is helping us deal with these and, and think through our responses very carefully and is helping us immensely. And that's happening across the territory. And I think it's really good. So yes, it is top of mind for First Nations, but also for municipalities, the federal government and the territorial government. As a matter of fact, I think all governments in the country are are really taking this very, very seriously, and we're seeing that going to that's going to ramp up, I'm sure, in the coming months and years. Um, is there a follow-up question from APTN? Yeah. Um, as this might be for uh, both of you. Um, as we all know, last summer, obviously, Yellowknife was evacuated um, because of wildfires. I'm just curious to you know, how likely is that to happen to us here in Whitehorse? And if that were to happen, are we equipped to handle an evacuation of uh, thousands of people? I'll start and I'll pass it over to Mike if I can. Um, uh, you know, I, I honestly think, um, you know, we what we saw what happened in, in Yellowknife last year. Um, and uh, so we are assessing and learning from the experience we saw there. Um, but the situation in the territory is a little bit slightly different and, and uh, perhaps um, we can get into that a little bit. But um, we have... Uh, we do have plans at the municipal level uh, and are working on plans. It's certainly top of mind for everybody. Um, what we're talking about is a potential um, emergency here in Whitehorse and are we, are we, uh, can we deal with it? Of course, we will deal with it should that calamity happen. I sincerely hope it doesn't. But um, uh, we have uh, the hard one experience we saw out of the Northwest Territories and other communities across the country and we are uh, certainly uh, assessing and doing uh, reviews of what happened there talking to our colleagues in our neighboring jurisdictions and uh, working through measures that will uh, stand us in good stead we have a very robust emergency measures system in the territory um, and uh, uh, we have a lot of road networks that uh, the, our sister territories do not have. None of it certainly doesn't have much in the way of infrastructure. We're very lucky to have the infrastructure we have here. Um, and so they're not totally analogous, but we certainly are learning lessons. And, and, this, is an, and this is something on everybody's minds. And were uh, an emergency to befall a community like Whitehorse, we would deal with it with the uh, pulling on the expertise that we have developed over decades in uh, community services and health and social services in environment and others so um, i hope that doesn't happen i'm sure that that sentiment is shared by everybody here at the table uh, but um, i have no doubt that were such uh, an incident to happen we would have the resources and the wherewithal the tenacity to deal with it as a community and as a territory. Um, that's a very high level answer. Mike, uh, I'm going to pass it over to you now. Sure. Yeah, as far as the, the likelihood, um, you know, much like Minister Austin said, I'd like to say it's impossible, but uh, we know from experience that um, it certainly is a possibility here. Uh, I wouldn't say it's inevitable, but, uh, but the work that's being done um, <clears throat> primarily uh, in, in conjunction with the city of Whitehorse on the 
uh, the white horse south shaded fuel break um, <clears throat> that alone gives us a lot more in the way of options both in uh, it can act as a fuel break um, as we saw from last season uh, the fires are quite happy to jump across multiple kilometers of lake and at other spots so it's not an absolute break but the other thing these shaded breaks give give our crews is an option to do things like burn off um, into into an oncoming fire so it you know, relative to even five years ago, we have way more options to uh, to try and and deal with a fire that is encroaching on Whitehorse from the south. Um, and as far as that, uh, beyond that, you know, there is regular uh, practice in working with the, the city fire department and the wildland fire crews um, and higher level discussions uh, that have lead back to Minister Most in terms of coordination plans. But uh, those are all things that are being looked at seriously, uh, you know, one of the words I've heard uh, recently from a pretty smart person was, and I'll paraphrase because I'll get it wrong, but uh, you know, it used to be okay to have emergency plans that were theoretical, and that's not okay now. Like these, we have to plan as if they might happen because they are happening other places, and and that is the approach we're taking to it. So to summarize, I would say not inevitable, but uh, we're certainly view it as as the serious threat that it is, and and do our best to be prepared. And as a postscript, I will mention that, um, uh, you know, we had Operation Inuk, I mentioned that earlier. We're also working with um, uh, the city of Whitehorse on a wildland fire evacuation exercise as well, which will be coming up in the coming, uh, I don't know when it's scheduled, it's in the next couple of months. So we will be working with our partners in Whitehorse on this very issue. Again, uh, practicing, developing the, the, the uh, muscle memory, the synapses between our, our organizations to work closer together and to actually test some of the assumptions we have in, in the event of such an emergency. So it's top of mind, uh, certainly for us, and we're not taking this lightly. We are working very hard, and I know that's a sentiment that's shared across the country. Like it's, it's um, my colleagues in, in uh, the provinces and territory are also uh, saw what happened last year in Yellowknife, and they take it very seriously and are working these things through. Okay, thank you so much. Um, now, I, I think I have CKRW and uh, I believe Darius and Dan. Uh, are there any questions from CKRW? Hey, this is Nathan Jordan with CKRW. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I believe this is for Minister Mostyn. Um, just want to touch on the collaboration with the City of Whitehorse. Can we, s will there be a development of an evacuation strategy from that uh, those training exercises? Um, well, I, again, uh, the municipality knows its borders and its resources and how to, you know, where its, its citizens, they are actually the, the lead on these things. So it'll be the city of Whitehorse that will be driving the uh, emergency planning within the city of Whitehorse. Um, it's a government, a municipal government. It has responsibility for emergency planning within its municipality border, municipal borders. And so we will be doing that as Yukon government is is absolutely working with the city of Whitehorse on on uh, emergency planning. As I said, we did it in, during the uh, Canadian Armed Forces Nanook exercise recently. We're going to be having another exercise with Whitehorse so that we can calibrate and work closer between our emergency measures organization and uh, and the citizens of Whitehorse. But it is uh, Whitehorse is the lead. I, I am loath to uh, move into municipal areas of municipal responsibility. We as a territorial government are there to support any municipality that feels uh, it needs support in these uh, areas. And if we're asked, we will certainly uh, um, respond uh, with whatever we can to support our municipal partners. Um, but we will do so when asked. And so that's how it is. That said, we were certainly working with, as I said just two minutes ago, uh, Nathan, that we are working with um, the city of Whitehorse. We're going to be having a tabletop exercise, a planning um, meeting or exercise in the next uh, couple of months, six weeks or so, I guess. So, um, yeah, we are working with our municipal partners, um, but they have the responsibility and the lead to actually do the emergency planning for their municipality. And if they have uh, any need for assistance, resources, advice, we're happy to step in when asked. Thanks. Follow-up question, Nathan? No, no follow-up. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Darius, I'm not sure what I would that you represent, or if in fact you do represent an outlet. 
He's gone. Okay. Um, and um, finally, Dan Davidson. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just wrap up and I'll just circle back just in case there is Dan on the line. Okay. Um, okay. Well, then, thank you so much, everybody, for attending uh, today.